How's everybody doing? Yeah. Say, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Are we ready to fight for our rights in 2015? Yeah. Good, because I am. Um, so first, I want to say I'm, I'm a little nervous up here. I'm not a public speaker. I'm just a regular person, right? Who, right. who does this work. Right. So, 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 so bear with me if I, if I stumble through my thoughts a little bit, okay? Um, second thing I want to say is that I'm honored to be here with you all today as we honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., not only by praising his name, but by continuing to do the work uh, that he started with many others um, in the civil rights movement. So again, thank you for having me. I want to thank the organizers for organizing this event. Thank KL and James for taking care of me, making sure uh, my stay here was well. <clears throat> so so uh, my friend here did a, did a good job with the bio, so I can skip that. Don't have to do that, right? Um, so I wanted to talk about a few things today. I know y'all probably want to hear about what's going on in Ferguson um, in, in St. Louis County because it's not just happening in Ferguson. They like to say that it's just Ferguson, but it's going on all over St. Louis County and city, right? Uh, people are engaged everywhere in the city. Demonstrations are going on everywhere in the city, and police are uh, coming down with that iron fist of repression everywhere um, in the city, right? So I, I know, I know y'all want to hear about that, but you, you really already know what's going on in St. Louis City. It's going on in Ohio is going on here in Seattle, it's going on in New York, it's going on in Phoenix, it's going on everywhere in the nation, and Albuquerque, and it's, it's called systematic racism, right? <clears throat> Where people of color are deterred, discouraged, and inhibited from reaching their full potential in American society by systems that are to whites only true social services, right? Systems like the education system, the criminal justice system, the financial system, the healthcare system, and the media propaganda systems. The list, the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on of institutions designed to benefit only one subset of the human race and those are white people, right? And so this systematic racism is evident when armed white men like Derek, Derek Daniel Thomas in New Orleans can go on an entire shooting spree, a high speed chase, and a standoff, have a standoff with police and be taken into custody. But on armed black children like Tamir Rice are shot dead within seconds of police responding. So we already know about that. We, we know that this is, this is happening all across the nation in our communities. I want to talk about something that everyone here may not know, right? So I want to talk about race. I want to talk about class, right? I want to talk about how we, 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 we deal with racism, we fight each other, we go tick for tack for all this stuff, right, when, all, it's, when we're all only one race. Right, the human race, right? We all originate from the same place, right? We all come from Africa, and, and we migrated out of Africa, right? So some folks migrated to the north, right, where the air was cooler, it was harsher, it was colder, there was less sunlight, right, so people became paler, their nostrils became thinner as to, 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 to not take up so much of this harsh air, right? People who migrated south, their, their skin became darker because of so much sun. Their hair became nappier and thicker to protect themselves from the sunlight. Their nostrils grew wider because the air was easier to breathe, right? So we, we have to realize 
that we're all brothers and sisters, one race, one nation, under God, right? And whatever the rest is. <clears throat> So race is, is merely a human classification system, right? It's, it's, it's used to, 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 to put, to, 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 to organize, right, races. I would even say that it's used to, 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 there we go, to divide and conquer, right? To pit, to pit people against each other with white folks on the top, black folks on bottom, right? Um, <clears throat> and so, like I said, we started in Africa, we migrated away, adapted and evolved in different ways based on the climates we migrated to. We all share 99.9% .9 of our DNA. There is some variation of our DNA based on the different geographical locations and populations, um, the different geographical locations of populations. And the further apart these populations are, as geneticist Kenneth Weese and Jeffrey Long put it, no, I'm sorry, and the further away these populations are, the greater the differences between them. But the boundaries between populations are, as geneticists Kenneth Weeds and Jeffrey Long put it, multi-layered, porous, ephemeral, and difficult to identify. Pure, geographically separated ancestral populations are an abstraction. There is no reason to think that we ever were isolated, homogeneous, parental populations at any time in our human past. Like I said, we are one race on one planet. <clears throat> race is a social construct, nothing more. One race, the human race. So, as this one race, this human race, a bunch of underclass folks, Right? We all really are in the same boat, okay? We are all slaves to the banks who print fiat currency out of thin air, right? Money who, that has no value, no gold or silver to back it up, right? It's, it's, it's created out of thin air. It's lent to our government at interest, right? That's why we have $18 trillion in debt, right? And we have to work to pay these taxes back. Right? That's why there's no money to put in schools or poor communities, right? Because we, we, we're so far in debt. And it really, I don't have really enough time to break down the Federal Reserve System. So I encourage you, when you go home, to do a Google search on the truth behind the Federal Reserve and, and really, uh, really research and try to understand how we all are, are slaves to, this, to, to the central banks, to this debt system, and how we all are being oppressed. Right? So, so, so while we fight each other with this racism garbage, these fat cats like sit up there on the top of the food train, you know, and um, live like kings while we, while we fight for scraps among each other. <laughs> um, so, police repression, right, of, uh, I was talking to uh, a reporter, Rihanna, for um, the, the name of the, 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 the magazine is slipping my mind now. I've got, got so many things coming to go, running through my head. But she, she asked me what, what I want y'all to take uh, away from what's been happening in Ferguson, right? And what I would want y'all, and not, I, I keep saying Ferguson, I'm getting caught up in that too, but what's been happening in St. Louis, not, not just Ferguson, um, is that that like iron fist of police repression that they brought down on us, when we, when we went out to demonstrate and protest, it can happen here. It will happen here if y'all do what we did. If y'all uprise in the way we did, they will come down the same way on y'all, you know? Um, that's what the Pentagon's 1033 program is all about. This program that puts these military-grade weapons, vehicles, and uh, training in, in the hands of your local police departments, right? It's about 
repressing the uprising of American citizens with military-like force. <clears throat> White or black, or Asian, or whatever you know, uh, color you are. I don't want to use the word race, because like I said, it's, it's one race, right? So whatever color you are. Um, and in fact, thanks to the Patriot Act, uh, signed into law by President Bush, and the National Defense Authorization Act, signed into law by President Obama, we all, as American citizens, have no rights, right? If we are deemed a terrorist, um, which we, 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 can, we can be deemed so under suspicion alone, right? There's, there, they do not have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are a terrorist. So something as little as participating in a nonviolent protest can have you deemed a terrorist. You can be, um, you, you can be detained indefinitely without charges or due process by the United States military under presidential order under the National Defense Authorization Act. So I, ju I just want to say that to say that we all are being oppressed right now. None of us have rights in this society that we're living in today, right? So in order to, to fight the real problems that we face as underclass citizens in America, first we have to undo racism, right? We have to, we have to come together as, as a people. Right, to fight the real powers that be, those one percenters, those central bankers, the CEOs of corporations, right, who want to keep us as crabs in a bucket, uh, fighting one another and not seeing them as the real enemy, the real true enemy, right? <clears throat> so what does that look like? How do, we, how, do, how, how, how do we do that? What are the solutions, right? Um, and I think it's coming together in spaces just like this, right? It's building community with one another. It's building relationships with one another. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's showing love to one another, right? That's the true revolution. That's what the powers that be are really most afraid of, us realizing that we're all connected. One love, one spirit, you know what I'm saying? One energy that flows through all of us, through the universe, you know, that's what they're really most afraid of, is us realizing our true power as, as, as the people, you know, and, and really uprising against the minority who, who, who run the country. <clears throat> so I'm, 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 I'm getting the time, so I gotta, I gotta get back. But like I said, I just wanna say, how do we move forward in, in 2015? How do we fight for our rights in 2015? We don't go downtown, we don't yell at police, we don't try to get any, any like legislation passed, right? We don't try to get these initiatives passed because just like the racial uh, equity initiative here that Murray Flowers and other organizers got passed here with, with uh, years of co community work a few years ago, it's gonna be co-opted, right? Because these are the same folks who've been oppressing us this whole time who we want to uphold these laws that we try to get passed, right? So, so how, how, we, how do we move forward? We have our own people's assemblies, just like this one here, separate from the state, right? You know what I'm saying? We, we collectively um, discuss what issues we face and ways to organize around them, right? Um, so, yeah, right. So, I mean, so we, we, what we have to do is we have to transfer that power from the state to the people, right? And, and the only way we do that is, is like I said, to come together as one, um, figure out these issues, what are our issues collectively, um, organize around those issues, build that community, build those relationships with one another, and out of those relationships, out of that community, we cultivate leadership from right there. We cultivate leadership from within this space, right? And, and we, 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 we stack the city council with those people. We stack our school board with those people. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and we support and hold them accountable. And they run on a platform that we collectively design as, as the community. So that's what the solution is. And however that looks, it just looks like, like I said, bringing love to events, bringing life to events, hold consistent events where folks can come together, build those relationships, have that space to get to know one another, build that community. And I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. All right, I'm, I'm up.
Good morning, folks. I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Lem Howell. Um, a little bit about my background before I start, so maybe others will join us. Um, I was, well, you want from the beginning, I was born in Jamaica, West Indies. Grew up in New York City. <clears throat> Uh, attended college on a scholarship from my father's union at Lafayette College and did four years of active duty in the United States Navy when I was commissioned at graduation. And I went to Boston College Law School for one year while I was in the Navy and then transferred to NYU Law School and graduated NYU Law School in 1964. I uh, came out here uh, in, to Seattle from New York in August of 1964 to work in Governor Rosalini's office on a Ford Foundation grant through the National Center for Education and Politics to, to uh, study state government. Uh, After I was on Governor uh, Rosalini's staff, Governor Evans defeated him uh, in the election of 1964. And then I was all set to go back to New York because I had taken the New York bar and had gotten the results that I had passed. But then I got a job on the state Supreme Court as a law clerk, and that is a very uh, treasured position. And so I, after that tour of duty was over, I was set to go back to New York. I might say that during that time, I had read of the Reese case. How many of you remember the Reese case? Good, at least one hand went up. Now, the Reese case in 1964 or 1965 involved two Seattle police officers getting off duty at 8 o'clock but put on Hawaiian shirts and met their wives and went out drinking. And finally, they ended up in the Lin Yin Cafe and uh, for dinner. There was a black couple sitting there, and one of the officers said, I don't like to eat around N in a loud voice. They had admitted to having at least five or six drinks apiece earlier in the evening. And he said it louder and louder again. So the male got up and called some friends. And uh, some of the brothers came down, and there was a fight in the Lin Yen Cafe. Uh, the fight was over, and Robert Reese and another individual got in the car and was leaving the Lin Yen Cafe parking lot. And one of the officers who had been in the fight came outside, stood next to a uniformed police officer, and shot into the car, shot a bullet into the dashboard and a bullet in the hand of Robert Reese. All right, there was an inquest, a coroner's inquest. And in those days, before the system that we have now, the coroner's inquest, Leo Sowers was the coroner no legal training whatsoever. And, but at any rate, the uh, jury found justifiable homicide. Uh, because they claim that one of the weapons that was being used in there was a dish, and that dish was used in the fight. Charles O'Carroll prosecuted uh, the, the uh, black fellows that were in the fight for assault, 
Uh, but then a civil case was brought by Dave Roderick and Jack Tanner. I think many of you remember Jack Tanner, who became a federal district court judge in Tacoma. At any rate, there was a real, and I can't shy away from the word, racist judge that made terrible rulings, gave terrible instructions, and so forth. Uh, the civil case was suing uh, the city of Seattle, Reese versus the city of Seattle. At any rate, they lost the case. But they prepared the transcript of the trial and had filed a notice of appeal. But it sat languishing there. And after I, let, I left the... Uh, uh, After I left the, the court, I became an assistant attorney general, and then I went out into private practice. And then uh, I saw that transcript out there. I'll say, I'll do it as a labor of love. And I got the briefs and argued the case in the state Supreme Court. And we lost five to four, but it was an in-bank hearing twice, and bank means the full court, heard it twice before, in those days we used to have uh, departments, departments one and department two of the court, four judges each, and the chief judge, ju they used to be called judge then, sitting in each of those. At any rate, they made, the, maj the majority of the court made terrible law, and Justice Utter, who recently uh, passed away. You know, there, there's some good people in the society, and he was one of them. And he died. Well, he just recently died. Anyway, he wrote a dissent to the opinion. All right? And, you know, you feel like the lone ranger out there because no, nobody else is there. And Judge Marshall Neal, who was on the Supreme Court, also dissented and a judge that I had clerked for in the Supreme Court, Judge Stafford, dissented. And, they, uh, and uh, Judge Marshall Neal saw me at the bar convention and said, keep fighting, Lem, keep fighting. Well, uh, he shouldn't have said that. <laughs> because next followed the Larry Ward case. I don't know, how, I don't see any as many gray hairs as uh, I thought might be in the audience. Larry Ward was shot and killed right here near Liberty Bank on uh, uh, 24th in Union. The Larry Ward case, we had a series of bombing. This is good for you younger people. This is your history, so listen to all that happened, all right? Larry Ward had been to Vietnam because his mother, who was a stalwart, you know, wanted her children to do right, said, well, you have an obligation to the country. That time we had the draft, and Larry went and served his time in the military and came, in, came home and was going to uh, work for the uh, U.S. Postal, take the test for the U.S. Postal Service. Anyway, he was at home when uh, an individual who was looking for somebody else because there was a series of bombings in the central area. Hard Castles Realty, the Safeway, and so forth. Uh, this is back now, and uh, you remember in the 60s, late 69, 70. All right, so they got Larry, this individual, his name was Alfie Burnett, Alfred Burnett, got Larry. Now, he, this Alfred Burnett, had robbed Carroll Jewelry Store and was coming out of the store right into the arms of a uh, police officer, a sergeant in the office. He had a record, so, but he was in jail. 
Through his attorney, he let it be known to Charles O'Carroll that he knew who the bummer was. Well, if you're in jail, there's a, a parole hold and you can't get out. But he got out. He had no such information, but he knew that both the police department and the prosecutor were being, a lot of pressure was coming on them because nobody could find out who the bummer was. He said, I know who the bummer was. Through the police department, they got dynamite. All right, the dynamite cannot explode without, without having a, a, a thing to make it explode. At any rate, he had this dynamite. They set it up so that right across from Hardcastle in the parking lot was a plainclothes officer. The police had examined the dynamite before, knew it wouldn't go off because there's no fuse to, uh, or whatever it is that causes it to go off. And so at 2 o'clock in the morning, they cruised up before Hardcastle Realty for, Dave, uh, for uh, uh, Larry to set off the charge. Well, they placed the dynamite, uh, or, or he placed the dynamite. Burnett went on, and then he stooped down to light the match. This, the, it isn't going to go off. The plainclothes officer from across the chute shot the shotgun, and it had one of those single shells that went into the window right above Larry's head. Larry got up and started to go down uh, uh, 24th Avenue. What had happened was that there were police all around the place. They allowed Burnett's car to go through, but here comes Larry, and he was shot to death. He's unarmed, but he was shot to death. I became involved in that inquest. That was where Leo Sowers, and I asked James McIver, who was another black attorney, to assist. All right, we were there in order for, if we had questions of the witnesses that the, that the prosecuting attorney office, uh, uh, you know, uh, presented, we had to write out our questions, give them to Leo Sowers, who was not legally trained, and he decided whether or not they would, they would uh, ask the question. Well, it turned out that it became a farce. And John Coughlin, a good old pinko from way back in those days, that's before your time, but John was a good activist. All right, John Coughlin. At the end of the one proceeding, he said, Mr. Sowers, this is a sham, and unless you permit Mr. Howell and Mr. McIver to ask questions, this is ridiculous. Well, the jury, the inquest jury, found, but, but get this, even without, even without our present there, there were six jurors, one got ill, so there were five inquest juries, and believe it or not, shock of all shock, the jury said on the questionnaire, yes, Ward died by criminal beings. We were ecstatic. Three to two, Larry Ward died by criminal means. The old statute provide if that's the case, then there should be an arrest warrant. The, the, the coroner should arrange for an arrest warrant and arrest the officer who uh, uh, was involved. No such thing was happening. Not only that, but Charles O'Carroll, who had used inquest juries before as a whitewash, got charges against John Coughlin for contempt of court because he erupted a, a, a legal proceeding. Number one, it was at the end of the proceedings and so forth, and the prosecutor came to me and said, you're a witness? I said, yes. He said, well, we're going to have you testify. What did he say? 
I said, you'll know what he said when you call me as a witness. He never called me as a witness. And Judge Quigley, probably the only decent thing he ever did, he dismissed the case against John Coughlin. All right, that was the beginning. And it was, it was distressing because umpteen other cases followed about blacks being shot. And for some reason, I got involved. But in the interim, before that, the rest of the cases came down, the freeholders had an election in Seattle, and they adopted a charter for King County, which provides that any time a law enforcement officer is involved in uh, uh, the death of a citizen, then there will be an inquest. So uh, while there was no formal procedure outlined, the King County Executive then asks the District Court for uh, the District of King County to, to conduct uh, a hearing. One of the problems that we have with the inquest system is that the same police officers, the same police department does the investigation. All right, so th that's kind of queasy. But then the prosecutor, the King County prosecutor, is the one that presents the evidence to the, uh, to the uh, 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 inquest jury. Well, the prosecutor already knows whether he's going to prosecute because he has the investigation. They say the inquest jury has no power other to answer some questions. It has one or maybe two good uh, uh, things going for it. Number one, there's a public airing, A-I-R-I-N-G. That differs from the grand jury that you used to have in Ferguson, all right? So because you have a public airing, then the, the press covers it, and you can go to court, and you can watch this going on. Except that the, the people that, who are represented there is the officer who did the shooting, the family of the deceased, and the prosecutor who is supposed to be impartial presenting the evidence. Well, let me tell you, they hide the ball sometimes. But at any rate, at least you get to ask questions. You can't make an opening statement and you can't make a closing argument. But at least you can have witnesses who were there saying what had happened. All right, now let me give you, you think Ferguson was bad? Do you think that the, the one in New York where they choked out that guy was bad? Let me tell you a real, the worst case that I've ever seen involved, and I've handled over a, a dozen of these inquests. One night, this young man, he's about 23 years old, sees his girlfriend, the mother of his child, and he's slapping her around. Well, she called 911, as she should do, because you can't have domestic violence. Well, the cops came, all right, and this happened right out here, right out here. And the fellow ran across, oh, I have another bad one I have to tell you. The fellow ran across an empty lot, ran across an empty lot jumped over fence and got hung up on a stanchion like this, all right? I'm really sorry that uh, Dr. Donald Ray isn't here because I couldn't believe his findings. He said that the muzzle of the gun was between 12 and 18 inches from the, from the, from the individual when he was shot. A cop stood over this guy lying like that and shot him shot him in the Adam's apple. Ch uh, 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 chief Stamper was the chief of police at that time. He came to the community and to Mount Zion uh, Baptist Church and he thought maybe, you know, 10 or 12 people. 750 people were there. What is this shoot shooting going on? He said, it's an unjustified shooting. The next day, he got the shooting review board report. And you know what it said? 
it was accidental and within police guidelines. It takes eight and a half pounds of pressure to pull that trigger on the Glock. All right? That's no accident. But you know what it is? I've been pondering. This young officer didn't go to the central area. Well, I'm going to get a black tonight. You know what it is? It's fear. They don't know what, and they get scared. They don't know what happened. And that's part of their training, and that's part of it. Because it, it's hunkered down, just like the New York cops are doing. If you're not in favor, you're watching the guy being choked or, and killed, and the mayor of New York says, I warn my son that what to do when he has contact with the police department, and the cops are mad at him. Mad at him! when you can see them choking out the guy. And that's why I'm sorry that Do Dr. Ray is not here, because he can tell you some of the cases we've had where it's called positional asphyxia. The fellow has a lot of mass, and they're on his back choking him out. I can't breathe. The cops used to have a nice name for it called the carotid sleeper, all right? They claim that on the side of your head are the carotid arteries that if you press on them, you become dizzy. But that isn't how it works. It always is the forearm that's preventing breathing. And you can't breathe. You need oxygen to go to the brain. And Dr. Dr. Ray is so knowledgeable in this. And when he saw in one case that we had, he said, that the chokehold is not a, 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 an acceptable hold unless you're using deadly force. He called the chokehold deadly force. And he went around to the training institutions telling them not to use it. It was outlawed in a case in, in, in uh, Los Angeles that uh, there was an injunction to prevent the cops from doing it. They know in New York not to do it. That what was this guy doing? Selling some four cigarettes and then they were choking him out and then he says, I can't breathe? That should be the thing. I can't breathe? No, you're, it, it's a hunker down philosophy. You're either for us or against and it can't work that way. Anyway, Getting back to this case that happened, I could not believe it. The irregularities that went on from the prosecutor's office. Now, folks, you shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but I want you to know that I went to Norm Mailing and I said, you can't, you've got to prosecute you got to prosecute because here it was, the guy shot him, and so forth. The inquest jury, because we, remember I told you that under the new procedure that was provided that there would be an inquest and that the families of the, of the deceased and the police officer would have representation there. And I told you it's developed that you couldn't ask, you could not give an opening statement or a closing argument, but you could ask questions of the witnesses so you had a public hearing. That is why our system of inquest is superior to the rest of the country where they have a grand jury investigation because you don't know what goes on in the grand jury investigation. We saw what happened in Ferguson. So the prosecutor, it is also a conflict of interest to have the prosecutor present the evidence because they have to work with these officers who bring in cases. And I've been screaming for years and years and nobody listens to me and, and so forth. But this last case in New York where the guys choked out and had what Dr. Ray calls positional asphyxia because he, he has a mass and the diaphragm doesn't get to expand so he can't eat because people are, are on top of him and choking. Not only can he not breathe, but the diaphragm cannot get going. And Dr. Ray has written articles on this. Well, at any rate, after the, the, the shooting, I think the fellow's name was Anderson. I told you that ran across the... Uh, the lot. Uh, 
that was, that was uh, I, I think, the high water mark. I was also upset with our mayor. Our mayor was Norm Rice. And I pursued the chief of police because he said, after he got the shooting review report, he said, it has been reported. I have received the chief of police report, and I have, uh, I'm not taking any action because the, the report justifies the action. This is, the, this is Chief Stamper that talks about community policing and everything. I was furious. And I said on TV, this is outrageous, and so on. Uh, Norm Rice said, listen to this. Now, I supported Norm Rice for mayor, all right? But I, I've got to tell it like it is. I don't like revisionist history. If it's there the way it was written, you tell it like it is. Norm said, I support my chief of police, number one, which was wrong. But then he said, we must also be mindful of the police officer's family. That's when I lost it. That's when I lost it. A young man is dead at the hands of police officer, and we're not concerned about his family. We're concerned about the officer who shot him. Well, Norm and I haven't been close friends. We're cordial. High norm, high limb. But, you know, that, that d did it for me. Of course, he's the hero of the downtown establishment, but that's neither here nor there. But I had to tell you and get this off my chest about what happened. How many of you heard about the Baldwin case? That's another atrocious case. Well, the Baldwin case involved a gentleman who had uh, the, the police department calls him 220, who had mental problems, right? And he was in Yesla Terrace, and they were going to evict him. Well, he locked himself up in the room and wouldn't come out. The, the uh, gate, the, the uh, manager of the uh, projects went to the door, open it, and a police officer to deliver the warrant, you know, to, to evict him, went in. And Robert Baldwin stabbed him with a sword right through the chest. And that officer, of course, died. Well, now there was a whole bunch of police that surrounded him. You remember what they said? You cannot kill a cop. We all knew in the community that, that Robert Reese was dead because there was a surrounding. Now, his son and his ex-wife went to the scene and said, let me talk to, uh, to said, we can get we can get him out. They, you know, they had, they had him in, in, inside, and the siege went on for 17 hours, and they had him inside. And his son said, well, let me, I can talk to that. The negotiator for the police department said, here, tell him to trust the police. Now, get serious. You don't say to somebody who is involved inside, trust the police? What kind of nonsense is that? He couldn't talk to him as his son. Well, they decided that they were going to, the SWAT team was going to go in. All right. They had tossed in some gas, you know, tear gas and whatnot and so forth, and opened the door and tossed something in. And he came out he came out, and I guess he had the sword or something, but there was a volley, a bullet. 
But that's not what killed him. He fell down. He fell down, and when he was lying prone, there was the officer with the gun, with the Uzi, pumping bullets into his back. He had 21 bullets in his back. I couldn't believe, I, I couldn't believe the report, Dr. Ray. I tried the civil case because uh, they, were, they were saying, I mean, each officer on the SWAT team who was there was represented by counsel during the inquest. And the jury again found justifiable uh, uh, or excusable homicide because he had killed a cop and so forth. But the point was more than excessive force was, was used. I got a dummy, all right, you know, one of those dummies from, from the uh, 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 stores. And I had holes poked where it was. And I said, I had Dr. Ray on the stand. So doctor, somebody couldn't be standing up and, and suddenly turn and so forth. The, the bullets went through the body into the floor. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And so we had a trial that lasted I don't know how long. The jury did a strange thing in the civil case that followed. They found that it was wrong for, for them to do, but they only valued his life like $2 or something. They said he was a killer. He had killed somebody and so forth. The SWAT team resigned in mass because they thought that the jury would say what they did was proper, and so forth. Let me tell you, since you're interested, about the legal foundation of these cases, the civil cases that you have. I'm going to allow for questions shortly, but let me just finish up on this. The civil case is based on, or at least the, the Federal uh, Civil Rights Act, Title 42, Section 1983, and that says if there is a violation of federal law, a case can be brought in both, it can be brought in federal court, but now the state also has jurisdiction. So that if there is excessive force that is used, they beat up somebody uh, or, or falsely arrest them or something, it can come under uh, the fourth, the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, and, and the Fourth Amendment. Everybody has a right to be secure in their person and their private papers. All right, and you can't invade somebody's privacy or or their physical being. So you have a basis for the federal uh, court. The problem we have, and is, since I'm no longer in federal court, I'm not afraid to say what is wrong with it. The federal judiciary is very autocratic. You don't get voir dire. You can't ask the questions that you can for jury selection, number one. And number two, they think they're there for important cases. That is, for cases involving multi-million dollars of corporations or cases that involve some of these terrorists, all right? They don't treat civil rights cases as cases of significance. Although some judges like the chance to have a trial, they don't have very many trials in federal court. Every, there's always plea bargains and whatnot, so they, they, they don't have that. And so that is my criticism of the federal court. But you say, well, why don't you bring it in state court? State court is ideal. Why? Because you can voir dire the jury. That is, ask prospective jurors questions. What are some of the questions that you can ask? I once asked, Ms. Green, do you believe cops ever lie on their oath? Oh, objection, objection, sustained. That's because the judges are not used to frank talk. If she, Miss Jones, doesn't believe a cop can lie under oath, then my client cannot win. 
right? Because there's a conflict in the testimony. So you have to approach it a little bit differently. Well, Ms. Jones, would you subject the officer's testimony to the same, with the same scrutiny that you would uh, uh, subject somebody, uh, uh, any other witness, and so forth? And you have to find ways of getting around conservative judges because they, what they say, what the judges say, you're governed. You're free as the bird out here. You can work till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. You can work on Saturdays and Sundays. Or you can take off in the afternoon when it's sunny. And you say, well, had being a lawyer, you're so independent. Not quite so, because when you're in court, you're subject to what the man with the black robes or woman with the black robe says. Getting around all of that, we discovered when we did focus groups, when you have a big case, you do focus groups. This is what all the, uh, uh, all the commercials and everything on what the Republicans do and so forth. You have focus groups. So you have focus groups. You know what the focus groups said? One third of the prospective jurors believe that cops can do no wrong. It doesn't matter. You know, don't confuse me with the facts my mind is made up. He's a cop and he's protecting me so he can do no wrong. One third said, I wouldn't believe a cop if he swore on 500 Bibles. All right? And that's the other part of the uh, population. And then finally you have one third of the population that said, well, what happened? In the old days when I first started, I used to call it police brutality. But when you say police brutality, it shuts out witness, it shuts out prospective jurors. Why is it? There they go again, police brutality. So you say, police misconduct. Oh, well, what's that? So at least you have their attention so you can talk about uh, uh, police misconduct. What we have is a serious situation. I am really sorry Jenny Durkin isn't here because she did marvelous as a U.S. attorney. Uh, let me tell you, Jenny Durkin got, started a lawsuit with the U.S. Justice Department to review excessive force by Seattle Police Department. And she's done that. And they, have, they now have an agreed order where there is supervision and collecting data of what has happened with the Seattle Police Department. So my hat is off to her. I hope that she would have become uh, US, uh, uh, Attorney General when Eric Holder uh, uh, resigned, but uh, it wasn't to be. I don't know the current occupant of that, of that office. But let me tell you, this is an age-old stuff from the time of my hero, Thurgood Marshall. All right, Thurgood was fighting police brutality from years and years and years, and we know of his big case. And today is Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, and he changed thinking in this country by being uh, perceptive that you can't, you have to fight it with nonviolence, all right? But Thurgood Marshall changed the laws in this country, in the states, by some 22 states where there was segregation. Once Brown versus Board of Education went and said separate but equal is not in fact equal, then that applied not only to the schools, but it applied in public accommodations and everything else. So, and, and that was nine to nothing. And that man worked his heart off all his life for equality and so forth. And all of that was the underpinning of when Martin Luther King Jr. came later, right? And he'd be sick. They talk about a post-racial society because we have a black president. Not so, you all. Racism is alive and well in this country. Why? Only 39% of whites voted for Barack Obama. 
And you saw what the uh, uh, minority leader, Mitch McConnell, said. His only goal was to, uh, to uh, oppose Obama. So what we had were 80% of the minority community, 96% of blacks voting for Obama. <coughs> Pardon me. And then you had, you had uh, uh, a lot of white women and younger people voting for Obama. But old white males did not vote for Obama. You can look at the figures. And what I'm telling you is racism is alive and well. And it always breaks down to this hunker down that they like, that they used to have in South Africa, right? You're with us or you're against us. And that's the mentality of the New York uh, Police Department and the Guild. Uh, and our guild here. It didn't matter how bad a situation is. They always support their own, and you have this conspiracy of silence. We've got to have community policing. Cops have got to get in the community and not be afraid of the people they serve. And you have to look at this. What is the motto of the police department? If it is to protect and to serve, then that says, sends the message to law. But if we're going to, uh, we're going to capture crooks and so forth, watch out. So what I'm telling you, it's very important. When you have police officers come to a community meeting, ask them, what is the motto of the department? Is it to protect and serve? Or is it to, well, we're going to catch crooks and so forth and so on? Because then they don't care. Uh, uh, about, uh, because by sight, if somebody is black, then he must be a crook, right? So everything else follows. So you listen and closely question them, whether it's the King County Sheriff or the Chief of Police or any of their uh, subordinates, ask them what the motto of the department is. Now, I, 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 I said I would leave time for questions and so that's what I'm going to do.